Hello, I'm Jeff Burden and welcome back to our class on Biblical Counseling. You know, today is our third class out of six, and the topic today is forgiveness. It's our greatest need, isn't it? Forgiveness. If you think back over your life of all the sin that God has forgiven, it's quite shocking, whether it be something in the last hour, week, month, year, it's our greatest need. God has forgiven us of so much. Again, it's just shocking. You know, there's a story that many old school preachers have used that I love, and it's not the perfect analogy or illustration, but it's just one that I've always liked. And it's that imagery of our lives being played on a movie screen in heaven, right? You're, you're placed in the front of the theater, and it's a giant movie screen. Every seat is taken, and, and the place is just packed out. The movie begins, and to your surprise, it's your life story. Completely uncensored. Nothing has been deleted. All the things you've done wrong, every sin is played on the screen. Even the things that you did when you thought no one was looking. That soundtrack is filled with every hurtful word, even the things that you mumbled under your breath. It even puts on the screen the horrible, hateful, sinful thoughts that you thought about. Can you imagine? Now, at the end of the movie, would you be likely to stand up and take a bow? Or would you want to run out the door in disgust? Well, the old-time preachers would say at this point, that film exists and God has it. The only way to avoid it being shown is to get God to destroy it. And that's why Jesus came. He died to pay the price for that sin-filled movie. And when we surrender our lives to Christ, God will take that film and throw it into the depths of the deepest sea. Just like in Isaiah 43, 25, where it says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake and remembers your sin no more. It's a simple illustration, but I love that sermon illustration that's used by a lot of the old school pastors because it makes a great point. Forgiveness is a wonderful thing. It's our greatest need. You never believe that truth more than on the day that you accepted Christ as your Savior. On that day, you saw how big God was and how small you were. You might remember back in on week one of our classes, we talked about how the bigger we see God, the smaller our problems get. But unfortunately, Christians sometimes forget and, and they kind of allow the truth of forgiveness to get pushed into the back of their memory. So this is our first key point, right? We must keep the truth of our own forgiveness in the front of our minds to maintain a forgiving attitude toward others. That's crucial for our own sanctification and for healthy relationships. You know, last week I quoted Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, and I'll quote it again today. It says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ forgave you. See, we have to spend some time in the Word remembering our own forgiveness and reminding others in our faith family about the pit from which we've been dug. So when it comes to giving biblical counsel to someone that is struggling with forgiveness, we do what I just did. We talk about our own forgiveness, and, we, and it's because it's really the only way that we will become forgiving people. And because we've been forgiven we should be forgiving. Now, as we always do, let's talk about some root causes. What are the root causes of an unforgiving spirit? You know, I just mentioned one of them, and that is the most common root cause is that we don't fully understand or maybe just ignore our own forgiveness. But what are some other things that you can think of that would be a root cause for someone not having a forgiving heart? It could just be the pain They've been hurt so badly, they just cannot let it go. Or it could be stubbornness. You know, I'm not perfect, I just can't forgive like Jesus does. It could be pride. I won't give them the satisfaction of my forgiveness. 
you know, lots of reasons for uh, a, a lack of a forgiving spirit in a person. And so as we're talking to other Christians, in this time today, we're going to talk about the fact that we have two Christians that want to come together and mend a relationship. And, and so there are lots of other issues. What do I do with a non-believer? How do I deal with someone who won't ask for forgiveness or forgive me? Those are all issues we can talk about. But today, we're going to focus in on two Christians that want to deal with it correctly. How do we help them through this? Well, again, we, we talk about our own forgiveness, right? We talk about those root issues. But above all, we talk about obedience. That is the goal. If we want a right relationship with God, that vertical relationship, and we want right relationships with others, we must focus on obedience. Because we're not going for just relief. We're going for long-lasting heart change. So as we talk through this big conversation, let me begin by laying a foundation of some basic truths on biblical forgiveness, some that might surprise you. Because we tend to water down what it means to really forgive each other. And we, we tend to, to change the steps that God asks us to take. So let's start by talking about what biblical forgiveness is not. Number one, biblical forgiveness is not just about saying, I'm sorry. That might surprise you. But that topic of apologizing, it's really not in the Bible. Well, the, the word apolog apologia is the word for defending your faith. That's where we get apologetics, right? But just to simply say, I'm sorry to someone and walk away, there is no concept of that in the Bible. In fact, going back to that word apology or apologia, it means a defense made in court. And when we are confessing our sin to someone and asking for forgiveness, the last thing we want to do is defend ourselves. How do you think that would go with my wife if I said, hey, I'm sorry I did this thing, but then I go through this whole defense of why I did it and why it was a good reason to do that. It would not go very well. And so here's some husband counseling. Never ruin a good apology with excuses. <laughs> you know, I'm sorry is certainly a part of the process, but biblical forgiveness doesn't just stop there at an apology. It isn't just saying I'm sorry. See, when we put our foot in our mouth, we only want to give the smallest, shortest, I'm sorry that we can get out and then run away. I stepped on your toes, I come to you, sorry about that, and it creates kind of an awkward moment where you feel obligated to say, it's okay, but nothing's been accomplished. We both walk away frustrated. So, it's the adult version of when your mom grabbed you by the ear to your brother or sister and, and demanded that you say you're sorry for throwing that ball at them, right? So you say, I'm sorry. They say, okay. You walk away, but nothing's really been fixed. And you're really not that sorry because it was, it was funny what you did and you're not sorry about it and, and they're not really okay with it because they're really mad at you. It's not been dealt with, right? So we've got to quit teaching our children to just simply say, I'm sorry and walk away. We've got to show them how to take it further with real biblical confession and forgiveness. Now, biblical forgiveness is, bottom line, really just more, more than that, right? And we're going to come back to this point, but it's more than just saying, I'm sorry. But another thing, number two, biblical forgiveness is not about forgetting. You know, the Bible never commands us to forgive and forget. It's a common misconception. God doesn't forget our sins. That would be impossible. He's God. He doesn't ask us to forget the sins against us. That also would be impossible. I mean, think about it. For, for us, forgetting is passive. I forgot where my car keys are. You don't try to forget where your keys are. It just happened. It's a passive act. You can't try to forget someone's sin against you. And if you do, you'll fail. In fact, the harder you try, the more difficult it will be. And you'll probably think about it more. So we have to remember that forgetting is not even a possibility. We can deal with it. And there's a part of forgiveness that includes the setting it aside. 
but it's never just a forgive and forget thing. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. So, as we move through, let's move on now to some of the things that we know biblical forgiveness is. I've thrown out a few surprises, not about just saying I'm sorry. It's not about forgiving and forgetting. Let's turn our focus now to what biblical forgiveness is. So you're talking to someone who's struggling with this issue and, and they're, they're, they're truly wanting to fix it. What do you tell them? Well, first of all, biblical forgiveness is about making a promise to change. See, there are two things that must happen in order for someone to forgive. Number one is sincere repentance, and then also confession. These two things must happen first. If I come to the realization that my actions have been sinful, and I acknowledge them to God, Father, I, I'm sorry I've done this thing. I, I, I'll deal with the person in a moment, but I have to start with you, Lord. Forgive me. Help me to take steps toward true repentance. See, it starts with God. But it doesn't stop there. If I acknowledge my sin to God, Father, I see how I've sinned. And secondly, I ask the Holy Spirit to help change my thinking. Strengthen me to put on a new mindset. And then number three, again, I pray, help me change my actions. Then we're on the right path for full forgiveness. We begin with the Lord, deal with it, then move on to the person. You know, in the Old Testament, there's that word for repentance, which literally means to do an about face, not just in thinking, but in lifestyle. In fact, there's an example in Isaiah 55. God says through Isaiah, uh, hey, look, Israel's not on track. Their mind is not like my mind. We don't think alike, and they need to realign their thinking. Listen to what it says in verses 7 and 8. It says, let the wicked forsake his ways and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God, for he freely will pardon. For my thoughts are not like your thoughts and my ways are not your ways, declares the Lord. So see what God is saying here is, look, repent, do an about face, turn away from the sin but turn to the Lord. Get your thoughts in line with God's and think like He does. So repentance means turning around and making a change. It's a promise to change. Then comes the confession. Now I've dealt with God. Now I have to deal with this person that I have harmed. And this part is easy to understand, but sometimes it's hard to do. Confession is naming our sin to the person we've hurt, right? Earlier I said we've got to quit teaching our kids to only say sorry because we need, that's only a part of it. We can't stop there. In fact, I, 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 I love this illustration on, on what this picture really should look like. Think of it this way. I'm holding a ball and my apology, and this is the problem, right? Uh, in an apology I say, I'm sorry. It becomes awkward. The offended party doesn't know what to do, so they say, it's okay, nothing's been dealt with. This is what we've been talking about. In fact, them saying it's okay is either a lie or they're condoning the wrongdoing, so this has not been dealt with. In the end, the wrongdoer is still holding the ball. But listen, with authentic biblical forgiveness, things work differently. The wrongdoer comes to you with his ball and he says, Hey, I've done this thing, this specific sin against you, and they name it. And they say, I was wrong. But we end with, will you forgive me? I've done this thing. I'm sorry I did it. Will you forgive me? That's the right way to do it. In doing so, I then hand the ball to the other person, and I'm free. I've been obedient. I've done what God asked me to do. How they respond? On a side note here, you have no power over that. If you approach them sincerely and lovingly, trying to communicate your sorrow, you've been obedient and you're free. Now, the wronged person has their own decision to make. Will they be obedient and forgive? 
Or will they decide to hang on to that ball and offend God? So do you see how we've got to go further than just simply saying, I'm sorry? It requires repentance, confession, and it ends with, will you forgive me? Maybe this sounds familiar, but this is exactly what we all do when we first accept Christ as our Savior, right? We feel the weight of our sin. It's clearer than ever. Suddenly, you're holding the ball, and you realize, I cannot come into God's presence unforgiven. So you fall to your knees, and you say, Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. There's the confession. And I want to turn from my sins. There's the repentance. Will you forgive me? There's the question. And so you put your faith and trust in Christ and going forward, you make a promise to change and live like Christ. Which brings me to my next point. What happens next? We came to Christ in repentance and confession, and then God steps up and he gives a promise to apply the righteousness of Christ to your account. He takes the ball or the videotape, whatever you want to call it, and he throws it away, fully forgiving you of all sin. That's how it's supposed to work. Which brings me to my next point. Remember how I said, it's not about forgetting. And I quoted Isaiah 43, where God says, I will remember your sins no more. You know, God choosing to not remember our sins is different than forgetting. Not remembering means God will not bring it back up or use it against us ever again. Key point here. Biblical, listen, biblical forgiveness is also about making a promise to not remember. See, we're called to do the same thing with each other. Remember Ephesians 4.32, it says, Be kind and compassionate toward one another, forgiving each other, listen, just as in Christ God forgave you. That means we are to mirror God's forgiveness. For you and I, forgetting is passive. We simply forget stuff. But not remembering is active. It's a choice that we make to forgive and then let it go. Write this down if you're a note taker. Not remembering means three things. Number one, I promise not to bring it up to you again. No using it in future arguments, no guilt trips. Secondly, I promise not to bring it up to others. No gossip. No stomping your feet and saying, look at me, how I've been hurt. Right? Let it go. And then number three, and this is a hard one, I promise not to bring it up to myself. That simply means I won't dwell on it. I won't allow Satan to attack me with it. I will push it back out again. This is over. I've dealt with it. I've moved past it. Not allowing ourselves to dwell on it. Man, that's tough. But this is us putting Ephesians 4 into action. Remember how Paul, in 4.22, where Paul says, put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the uh, attitude of your minds and to, and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. We push out the old issues and we put on right thinking. Now our story turns out like this. The wrongdoer comes to you holding the ball and says, I've done this thing against you. Will you forgive me? A promise has been made to do an about face, to, to change thought and actions. They hand the ball to you. Now a shift has occurred. The ball is in your court. Will you be obedient? See, when you choose to forgive, a second promise is made. And there's the one it says, I choose not to remember. I forgive you, and I won't bring it up again. I'm going to bury the matter and put it to rest. I forgive you. In the end of this correct way of doing it, if both are obedient, the ball is tossed away and the matter is dealt with. See, true biblical forgiveness is about two promises, a promise to change and then a promise not to remember. 
biblical forgiveness between two Christians is a face-to-face, one-on-one reconciliation where relationships are mended. I hope this is making sense. Because remember, our goal is a change of heart. It's about obedience to God. He asks us to love one another. In John 13, 34, Jesus says, A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. See, we're to love one another in that way, just like Christ loves us. We are to forgive one another as God has forgiven us. So, just like the the passage in Isaiah where God says, As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, we are asked to do the opposite of what the world does because his ways are higher. They are better. And when we mirror God and his forgiveness, we honor God. We glorify his name. So, here we have a friend, we're giving them biblical counsel, and, and we, we, we might need to do several Bible studies, but there's one in particular in Matthew 18 that you could take someone to. In fact, turn over there to Matthew 18. Here is where we find a great example on the issue of forgiveness. By the way, chapter 18 is full of great stuff, right? I mean, there's, there's dealing with, with sin among the church, there's church discipline, But I'm going to focus here near the end of the chapter on the issues of forgiveness. Listen to this conversation between Peter and Jesus in Matthew 18, 21. It says, Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. Now, pause right there. Man, that's a great question, right? We've all wondered it. This guy keeps hurting me. How many times do I have to forgive him? Because, see, back in the day, the Jewish rabbi, he taught that for you to be holy, you would have to forgive someone up to three times. So here's Peter, thinking he'll, be, he'll go overboard, he's going to be extra holy, and he suggests to Jesus seven times. But Jesus <laughs> turns it up, upside down and says, you know what, let's just make forgiveness limitless, right? Let's say 77 times. He could have said it 7,000 times because forgiveness is, well, it's a heart issue. Remember the words of Jesus where he says, love one another as I have loved you? Think about that. How many times has Jesus forgiven you? Three times? Seven times? 7,000 times, right? See, he's teaching us to love one another as he's loved us. And so think about, again, as I started off this class today, all the words, all the actions, all the sins we've committed against God, forgiven. Sin completely dealt with and remembered no more. See, with the strength of the Holy Spirit, you can do this. Forgiveness should be limitless. So he says seven, 77 times. Now, Jesus continues this with a parable. Let's pick it back up in 1823. Look at verse 23. It says, Therefore, and this is a little lengthy, but I want you to stick with me on this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt and let him go. Pause here. So far, so good. The servant owes something that he can't pay. In today's dollars, it would be, this is like a million dollars, right? He begs for mercy, and the king, shockingly, cancels the debt. Keep reading. Verse 28. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. By the way, that's about a thousand bucks. Nothing like what he owed. He grabbed him 
He began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he said. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed. And they went and told their master, this is the first guy, the top guy, right? Everything that had happened. Well, verse 32, the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all your debt because you begged me to. Should you not have the same mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? Right, now you begin to see that similarity between how God forgave us and we have to forgive. Verse 34, in anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he could pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Stop there. Listen, unfortunately, we all fall into sin, right? Just like this servant. Forgiveness is hard. I, I get that. So be compassionate with your fellow Christian that comes to you with this issue because it's a hard topic. Because even as Christians with new hearts, we fall into sin. We want to put limits on forgiveness. We don't want to choose to not remember, right? We want everybody to know that we've been stepped on. Because again, forgiveness is hard and we're prideful and we're stubborn. This parable begs the question, that root heart issue question. Have you come to a full realization of what God has done for you? See, in this parable, the servant is the sinner. He represents you and I. The king is God. And notice what God does. Does he grab the first man by the collar and shake him and yell at him, pay me what you owe me? Does he agree with the servant that he should uh, have more time to raise the money and pay off the debt? No, he doesn't do that. Look at how far the king goes. He says, account settled. I clear the debt. You don't even have to earn anything to pay me back. I absolve you completely. It's been forgiven. You're free. Man, that's powerful. And while this is a picture of how we are to treat another person, we also recognize this story again, don't we? If, if you've given your life to Christ, this is your story. It's a picture of what God has done through Jesus Christ. It's really a picture of God's generosity, His grace. He, he doesn't require us to earn anything or work for something that we can't pay back. We can't live in a way that would ever satisfy his perfection. Instead, what does he do? He sends his son. He crushes his son. And this is a key point. It is crucial. Listen, it is crucial that we recognize God's forgiveness isn't an easy thing to do. It's not an overlooking of sin or him winking at guilt. It's not a pardon that is easy to give or one that costs nothing. See, forgiveness, our forgiveness was purchased at the cost of Christ's life. He punishes his son for our sins. And then God says, debt paid, debt canceled. Live your life as one that is thankful for God's gracious gift. Listen, unfortunately, this servant fails the test put before him. He experiences all the king's compassion. He has millions of dollars forgiven and erased, only to turn around and shake down his co-worker for a thousand bucks. Completely unforgiving. He does the opposite of what the king has done for him. Listen, for the point here is that for us to not forgive one another is really unimaginable in comparison to what God has forgiven us. At the end, look at verse 35. Remember how it said, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. What does that mean? It means someone that does this clearly doesn't have a right heart with God. If we run around crying about everyone 
to everyone else about how so-and-so stepped on our toes, if we walk around with folded arms, holding on and to, to an unforgiving spirit, especially after today's class, right, right, then we may need to re-examine our heart toward Christ. When we give, listen, kind of wrapping this up, you guys, it, it, when we give biblical counsel to our fellow believers, there, there are several points I hope today you've picked up on. We, we've been forgiven so much. And because of that, in obedience to God's calling, we must also be forgiving. See, see we're not looking to gain relief, right? We're looking for a heart change, for obedience. So wherever you are on this issue, whether you need to give forgiveness or ask for it, please remember that when God asks for something of us, it's for His glory. You know, earlier this week I was reading a book called The Pursuit of Holiness by Jerry Bridges. Wow, fantastic book. Get it, read it. It's fantastic. He was writing about overcoming sins, those repeating sins that we keep coming back to. And he says, you know, we, we think we're getting it right, and then something happens and snap, we're angry about something, we fall into sin. Or snap, we judge someone. Or snap, we lose control of our tongue. We're on track, and then one little thing happens, and we're back in the pit again. You know what he said? He said, our problem, and I'll quote him, our problem is that we are more concerned with our own victory over sin than we are about the fact that our sins grieve the heart of God. See, some say, and the scriptures tell us this, oh, I have sinned again. Others will say, oh, I've sinned against heaven and against God. When we see a particular sin as being against God, we're God-centered. When we only think about sins as victories or failures, we're being self-centered. Not that those aren't important. They are. But with all of these topics, anger, forgiveness, marriage, temptation, depression, the focus must always be centered on God. He is our motivation. He's the one that we're living for. So, I hope this has been helpful. Keep doing what you're doing. Stay in the Word. As you counsel yourself with the Scriptures, as you counsel others with the Scriptures, just be in prayer about it, take it to the Word, do Bible studies on these topics. I tell you, you'll go so far with this. Next week, we're going to talk about marriage and divorce and remarriage. Some tough topics. So I hope you'll come back for week four of six. In the meantime, have a great week. My name is Jeff Burden. Thanks for joining me today.